There is the rumble of a giant traveling crane overhead, moving in with its burden. A huge ladle of molten iron from the mixer, where it has been awaiting this final step in the process of becoming steel. They are placing the chute into position for pouring the charge. And as the crane draws near, note that the men actually handling the metal are either sheltered high up on the crane in the cab or operate electrical controls across the floor. There goes the charge. 50 tons of white-hot liquid metal heated to approximately 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit. Hazardous? Frightful danger in this job? Not at all. Millions of dollars have been spent by modern steel mills of America for safety. Devices are employed which not only protect the worker from molten metal, from metallic dust and from flying chips, but also from human carelessness. The of steel production has made work simpler and safer. Men are not doing dangerous jobs that the machine can do more safely, but more men and more competent men are required to control the machine. And the safety achievement of the steel industry is a high tribute to the intelligence of these men who work in the mills. Like good cooks, they must know the temperature of the brew, and they measure it on an optical barometer while it boils in a white-hot pool as big as a fair-sized room. And like good cooks, they even take several samples of the brew using a long-handled small ladle to pick up enough liquid steel to cast a test ingot. It congeals almost instantly, and is soon dumped out and handled quite readily. When it is cooled, it will go to the metallurgical laboratory for a thorough but quick examination before the metal from which it was taken is drawn off to be made into steel. Thousands of different kinds of steels are made like this every day. Each steel, strange as it may seem, a custom-built product. Each different steel, the filling of a prescription to bear certain, to be of a certain hardness, to be soft, flexible, dull, bright, to be tailor-made for each one of thousands of uses. Now they are ready to tap a big one, and they must reach across to the opposite side of the furnace to break through the clay plug tapping hole from the inside. But the place to see the spectacular part of the operation is on the other side of the open half furnaces, where an asbestos clothed worker burns through the exterior of the clay plug tap hole with an oxygen torch. A few more ramming blows with a long tapping iron, and there she flows. 200 tons of steel produced according to specifications for one of an infinite variety of uses. Just the proper percentages of carbon and other elements are retained in every heat of steel so that it will possess the exact characteristics needed. Men on the platform will shovel in the correct amounts of Spiegel, ferromanganese, ferrosilicon, or whatever agent the metallurgical laboratory has prescribed for this particular heat of metal. Higher and higher it mounts in the great ladle, until the slag, the undesirable portion of the charge, rises to the top like froth, and overflows to find a future usefulness as a byproduct in other lines of business. The electric crane moves into line to carry the ladle to the pouring platform, where a train of cars bearing the ingot molds is waiting. When this molten metal has been poured into molds, the basic business of making steel is ended. Thereafter, it is only a matter of fashioning from the ingots the form of product desired. The steel man says that this fiery liquid freezes immediately in the mold. He means that it congeals when its temperature goes down a thousand degrees or so, and within an hour is frozen too hard on the outside for rolling. Thus, it is not of a uniform consistency. So after the molds are stripped from the ingots, weighing from 5 to 15 tons apiece, the huge castings are hauled away to a furnace called a soaking pit, in which they are heated until of the same temperature throughout, and which holds them at exactly the right heat for the anvil of the modern blacksmith, the rolling mill. Now this steel is fairly on its way to you, because in this one chunk of white-hot metal, there may be thousands of cans, kitchen utensils, or perhaps the materials for automobile bodies, refrigerators, 
and innumerable things in everyday use. And this universal use of steel is possible because its cost is only two or three cents a pound, the lowest of any important metal. The wide strip continuous mill made it possible to provide sheet steel wide enough for the all-steel automobile body and the one-piece steel top on the models of today. It is one of the many great advances in the art of steel making, which has brought a saving to the consuming public in the form of lower prices for better steel amounting to nearly three hundred million dollars a year compared with costs of ten years ago. Automobile users alone are saving seventy-five million dollars a year. But in spite of more men are needed in the mills and employment is now at the highest level in the industry's history. There goes that ingot you saw, now a hot slab, flattened and elongated on its way to further reduction. Now reduced by further rolling to the size of armor plate. And now becoming a huge strip, several feet wide and less than a quarter of an inch thick. It moves to the table where it will await its turn in the coiling machine. Coiled hot, it is subsequently cold rolled flat after passing through an acid cleansing bath. Two processes which vastly improve the smoothness and polish of the surface before it is cut into the lengths prescribed by the factory to which it is to be delivered. In general, only the rarer metals such as gold or platinum have ever offered much resistance to corrosive attack until the steel industry developed stainless steels which have made this metal practical for an endless variety of uses wherein it combines beauty with resistance to rust and corrosion. Look at that polish, a permanent mirror-like surface, perhaps destined for some swanky cocktail bar or the kitchen of a modern home. Here is an operation which constitutes in itself a critical test of steel, the piercing of a solid billet to form a seamless tube. And here is another interesting operation, also a critical test of steel, the making of a car wheel. The wheel must retain its specification factors of strength and ability to take it when subsequently it will be pounding over the rails. On another mill, a big ingot begins to take form with a first rough rolling, becoming elongated as it passes through another roll, and then assuming a familiar shape as we see the outline of an H column, destined for some skyscraper or perhaps a great steel bridge. The operators of the mill, up there above it, and completely shut off from the heat of that white-hot steel, turn it, spin it around, roll it by pressing buttons or throwing levers, and finally deliver it at the far end of the mill, a completely finished job. Steels pass through various mill processes or combinations of processes in order to make them suited to a wide variety of uses. In any giant ladle of molten metal, there may be steel that is destined to defeat time and distance, to provide the framework of mighty buildings, and to enter into the daily life of every citizen and thousands of things that provide comfort and convenience with the economy. The call for steel from every section of America is a demand for a basic material without which life and living standards as we know them today would be impossible. Steel has kept pace with and anticipated the increasing needs of the nation. Men and steel provide a nation with its comforts, its luxuries, and its progress.